welcome to our Wednesday study. Uh, we are continuing in our uh, study of forgiven to faithfulness, and uh, lesson five is where we're at. The title of the lesson is Where Godliness Comes From. Last week we looked at a godly lifestyle. This week we're going to look at where it comes from. Um, most people would probably say that's an easy answer, but... Um, you know, when it comes to the uh, death of Christ, most people would uh, identify uh, that uh, it is uh, tied to the deliverance from the penalty and the punishment of sin. But I don't believe that a whole lot of people would tie it to the power uh, to the deliverance from the power of or slavery to sin. And so we're going to look at uh, a couple of things uh, today. We're going to be in. Titus chapter 2, and also uh, the first part of Titus chapter 3. We're going to jump around a little bit, uh, so uh, hopefully I can uh, keep you on track and you won't be completely confused. But the Bible does tell us in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 that we are a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away, behold all things become new. And uh, the new creation that Christ uh, creates uh, for us or in us uh, is shown through our attitudes, our values, and our actions. Um, the Christian life is not a do-it-yourself program. It's not a uh, pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps your, uh, system. It's not even a, a self-improvement plan. It is. Uh, it would. It would be a, a process of good works that are simply done uh, or made possible through Jesus Christ and His substitute, substitutionary sacrifice uh, on the cross. So, uh, before we get started with our outline, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to to be able to to come together in this format. To, to Look in your word. Pray, Lord, that you would just be with each one that is watching, and, and uh, may they have understanding, but uh, most of all, Lord, may they find something that they can apply to their lives. Help us, Lord, to uh, be faithful to you, be consistent, help us to live the godly lifestyle that uh, would be uplifting and honoring to you. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So point number one in your outline is going to be the basis for godliness, the basis for godliness. We're going to start in verse 11 of chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, and it reads, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, I wish we could spend a whole lot more time on, in this study. Unfortunately, it is, it is condensed, and there's so much that we could, that we could uh, look into. But keep in mind that a, a Sunday school lesson or a Bible study is simply a means to get uh, basic information. And it would be your responsibility to dig deeper. And, uh, and so I'm just going to touch on a few things here. But in verse 11 it says, uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. And we can, uh, through, through research and through study, we can, we can see that the grace of God would refer to Christ's first coming. John chapter 1, verse 1, John chapter 14, uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, excuse me. Uh, all these talk about uh, uh, Jesus Christ coming in the form of man. And he was motivated by the grace of God to come to earth. Uh, you can read that in, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 17. But there's a statement there that says, uh, that sometimes gets a few people confused. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. And the phrase there would be, appeared to all men. And I would venture to, to say that to all men is not a tied to hath appeared, but it's tied to the, the phrase, uh, that bringeth salvation. Uh, we know that Christ did not see everybody on the earth 
when he was here the first time. Um, and, and we can we have common sense about that. Uh, but we do know that salvation is for all. And we know that Christ died for all. Now I'm not I'm not trying to teach there's a there's a teaching out there called universalism. And uh, and that would there would be people out there that would try to, to tell you that everybody is saved. And that is not the case. When I talk about salvation is for all, there's a couple of things that I would, would talk about. First of all, it is provided for all at Calvary. Um, we would um, the the doctorate people, the, the ones that are more educated than I, would call this unlimited atonement. Um, and, and that simply means that uh, Christ, uh, Christ's death was sufficient for all, uh, Christ's death made provision for all, and Christ's death is available to all who believe. And that is, that is just uh, what unlimited atonement means. But also this uh, uh, bringing salvation to all men uh, means that uh, Christ's death made possible God's common grace uh, and blessing upon all. Uh, in other words, well, I'll use an illustration. I got saved in my uh, early 20s, and I can assure you that there were many things that I did before I got saved that God had every reason to, to send me to hell. But he didn't. He showed grace, and because of that grace, I was able to uh, meet someone who uh, showed me in Scripture how to be saved, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Uh, but that is that is God showing His grace to all men. In verse eleven, what we have there, um, He does not send people to hell immediately after they sin. Uh, he, his grace is. Uh, uh, extends to all, and he gives everyone the opportunity to repent. Now, don't take that in, in light that uh, you can sin and sin and sin, and at the last minute before death, you can uh, repent of those sins and get saved. Uh, none of us know the time or the hour that we're going to die. And, uh, and so when you're given the opportunity uh, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior, if you have not already done so, you need to do so. But um, salvation, uh, uh, the salvation that, that Christ offers, uh, that form, um, it, it changes one's behavior in, in multiple different ways. Um, but uh, it, it frees us primarily uh, from the mastery of sin. It, it, it takes away uh, the the obligation that we had before we were uh, saved uh, to uh, to obey sin or, or to fall into sin, give in to sin. Uh, after we're saved, we become a servant of God. He has, has purchased us uh, from the slave market of sin, and now we have the opportunity to reject um, every offer to sin that's placed before. And um, uh, we, we can only do that through him. We know John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, uh, the vine and the branches. Um, we can do nothing without him. And so we need to understand that, that uh, uh, salvation uh, not only frees us, uh, gives us that, that, uh, that uh, pass to, to heaven, but it also frees us from that power of sin, frees us from the, the uh, uh, ability to sin. That's all in point number one. I wish we could go into to more detail, but point number two, more godly behaviors. Now, as we've been studying Titus, and anybody that's ever studied Titus in, in the past uh, probably can honestly say that they would could never be ignorant of how God wants them to live. <laughs> it is just full of direction on, on how we should respond. And as I said before, just because it looks like something is written to a pastor or an evangelist or a specific person, uh, every word of God is for each and every one of us. And so we ought to uh, take it all to heart. But here 
uh, in the next section here, verses uh, verse 12 is what we're going to look at, and then we're going to jump down to chapter 3. Uh, we see a couple of different types of behavior uh, that are, are explained to us. The first one, and, and um, under point number two, would be A, general behaviors. And that's going to be found in verse 12. And it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the first one that we would have uh, would be to deny or not to do. Uh, that's what God is, is telling us here, that we are to, not, uh, to deny or not to do. And th that would be we are to deny ungodly, ungodliness and worldly lusts. Ungodliness is simply a lack of reverence towards God. A lack of reverence towards God. Um, I like reading the Old Testament. Uh, just simply because I can put myself in their place. I can, I can see myself doing the same things the Israelites did. And so many times uh, in the history of the Israelites, they, they moved away from God. They, they showed the lack of reverence by bringing in idols and, and doing things that uh, they shouldn't have been doing and not doing the things they should have been uh, doing that God directed them to. That, that's showing a lack of reverence towards God. And we do the same thing. Um, uh, we need to, to understand when we're not following God's direction, we're showing a lack of reverence to Him. Um, uh, when we are doing things that, uh, that are sinful uh, and, uh, and ungodly, we are, are showing lack of reverence. How do, we, how do we get around that? How do we overcome that? Well, the key is to remember uh, that the one who meditates on the Word of God the most is probably going to show the, the least lack of respect towards God. The more time we spend in word, the, the Word of God, the more time we're going to learn about Him, the closer we're going to draw to Him, and the less that we're going to show that lack of respect. Uh, just, just think about the last time that uh, that you fell, that you you went into sin, uh, and, and you did something that you knew you weren't supposed to be, uh, be doing, and you separated yourself from God, you separated from yourself from His people. Um, how was your Bible study? How much time were you spending in the Word of God? And I can I can venture to say that it was probably very little, and I know that's the case with me as well. When I'm struggling the most, when I'm doing those things that I shouldn't be doing, thinking those things that I shouldn't be thinking, it's because I'm not in the Word of God. And, and so we need to make sure that we, we have this book close by. We have it with us in some shape or form at all times. So when we have free time on our hands, and here lately a lot of people have had some free time on their hands, uh, we, need to, we need to be in this book. We shouldn't be neglecting the, 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 uh, uh, the opportunities that God has given us to be able to read his word. So we have ungodliness, and we also have what is called worldly lusts. Worldly lusts. Now, we, uh, we can basically encapsulize this into basically everything the world system consists of. Um, we know that the world system is controlled by Satan. And anything of the world uh, is uh, going to be directed, controlled uh, by Satan. And his goal is uh, to keep the unsaved uh, unsaved. And he's, uh, his second purpose is to uh, destroy the testimony of those that are saved. And so he is going to do everything he can. He's going to do that through the world system. And, and, and lust simply is a desire flesh. And uh, he's going to use everything that he possibly can to entice us. Um, worldly lusts are going to be those things that, that rise above uh, those things of God uh, in our heart. They're going to be typically they're going to, to, to be focused on material possessions, um, uh, temporal things uh, that uh, we, we could focus on. And the key here is to deny those things. 
Now, how would we be able to deny those things? Well, the same same way that we would would uh, deal with ungodliness. We've got to be in His Word. Um, we, we need to understand that the Word of God changes lives. And it just doesn't change the life of a, an unsafe person. It can change the life of a safe person every single day. And so we need to be in the Word of God. So um, we have these things that, that Paul tells Titus that we're to deny or not to do. But he also gives us uh, things that we are to do. And he uses the term live here. And if you jump down to, um, uh, let's see here, um, the end of verse 12, or halfway down, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We've looked at these terms before, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through them, but, but soberly is, is dealing with the mind, okay? right thoughts, and uh, thinking those things that are godly. Uh, righteously uh, is, is, is our behavior, that doing, uh, uh, performing right behavior in, in, the act of, in, in the presence of God. So we have, we have our, our thoughts covered, we have our actions covered in, in this passage of Scripture. Um, he goes on, um, well, the, the one thing that I've learned about uh, the Word of God, let me back up here and, and read verse 12 again. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Always remember, when God tells you that he doesn't want you to do something, he will always tell you what to replace that with. He never leaves you hanging. Um, he, he always gives you something to fill the void that he take, tells you to get rid of. And, uh, and so we need to always uh, focus on those things. Focus on, on what he tells you not to do, but also look for those things that he tells you to do. Uh, he will always give you substance. So we looked at, at uh, uh, letter A there, um, the general behaviors. Now we're going to look at some specific behaviors, B, and under the outline there that you have. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we're, we're going to look at a couple of specific behaviors. And uh, uh, probably one of the biggest struggles of a Christian is that uh, uh, we are not of this world. And God tells us that we need to separate ourselves from this world. But yet at the same time, we have to live in this world. And it can be somewhat frustrating <laughs> and uh, somewhat difficult. And we would say that, uh, that the term that's commonly used by Christians is we are not of this world. Uh, we are to be in this world, but we are not part of this world. That would be the, the phrase that we would usually would use. Uh, but God gives us specific direction on things uh, that we are to do while we're in this world and things that we're not to do. And, um, and so he gives us here in chapter 3 some specific behaviors that we uh, need to fall back on while we live in this world. The first one uh, is found in verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And so we see here uh, he is dealing with principalities, powers, magistrates. We would call that our governments. Our governments. Um, what he's telling us is we are to be subject, as it put them in mind to be subject to, we are to be subject to our government. Um, uh, we are to uh, uh, be submissive uh, to, to our government. It, the idea of that word um, uh, subject is, is one that indicates a voluntary submission, not something that would uh, require you to be forced. And, uh, and so uh, we, we need to be voluntarily submitting to uh, those that have authority over us. Uh, we can go to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. All these passages of scriptures give us instructions on how to pray for our government leaders, how to respond, um, and uh, even give us reasons why we should do so. But obedience uh, to a human government, to human rulers, is not absolute. That this is not telling us that we need to do everything that the government tells us to do. There are going to be some things that the government requires um, that's, that God specifically forbids. We should not be doing that. We should not be partaking in that. But there are also going to be things that the, the government uh, specifically um, forbids that God requires. Those are the things that we need to continue to do. Uh, I venture that one day, um, maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly in my grandchildren's lifetime, I'm sure there will be a point in time where we're uh, in this country forbidden to the church. That doesn't mean that we don't go to church. If you go to a country that is forbidden to meet, they still have underground churches. They still meet in secret. And I think it's vital. One of the things that I have learned during this, this uh, health scare, or whatever you want to call it, is that there are a lot of people that have taken this period of time to be out of church, to separate themselves from church, to separate themselves from the God, uh, people of God. And, and I truly believe that uh, uh, this has hindered uh, a, a lot of individuals, a lot of families, and uh, we may never see them darken the door of a church ever again. Um, and, uh, and we need to be praying for those people. I need to lift them up and allow God to work in their lives and, and uh, hopefully be restored. So we have the government here, but we also have society. If you look in verses 2 and 3, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And so our, our obligation, our behavior to society is uh, found in a, a couple of different ways. Number one, uh, we're to... Uh, well, at the end of verse 1, it says, to every good work. And, and we need to be ready to, to do every good work, as God will say. We can go to, excuse me, we can go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. And we can, we can see how we should be responding with good works. Even to those that don't treat us well. And if that's not a difficult thing to do, I don't know what is. Um, treating somebody with good works when they're treating you with evil is a very difficult thing. And so we need to make sure that we're ready to do every good work. But secondly, we need to make sure that we're not speaking evil of, of any man. Uh, the word speak evil, we can also, it's also interpreted blasphemy. And you say, well, how do you blaspheme? Uh, blaspheme a person. Well, uh, just look at the background of a person. Who are they? Well, they are a, uh, a person that was made in the image of God. And when you blaspheme or you speak evil of a person, you are, are speaking evil of, of someone that God has created, saved or unsaved. And so we are, are speaking evil of of God in essence. So we, we need to understand that, that our evil speech toward another person uh, is, is also directed to the Lord. We need to be very cautious of that. But thirdly, we are not to be brawlers. We're to be peaceable. Now in, in today's society, everything is solved through fighting. Um, if you, if you watch movies, you, you recognize very quickly that 
it's sometimes very hard to tell the difference between the good guy and the bad guy. Uh, that's the reason I like the old westerns. There was no problem differentiating the, the difference between the good guy and the bad guy because the, the bad guy was always physical, he was doing evil, he was doing bad things, and the good guy was always doing good. <laughs> uh, he never used his gun. He never fought. I mean, it was it was the way the good guy responded, and we need to make sure that uh, we are not responding in violence. It's so easy to, to pick up that mentality when we're surrounded by that all the time, and uh, and so we need to make sure that we're responding uh, in a peaceable manner. How does that happen? Well, if you look at the end of uh, verse 2, it says, showing all meekness unto all men. Showing all meekness. Uh, meekness is what creates gentle actions. If you look at the life of Christ, did he respond in violence towards those that were uh, beating him and, and smashing those crown of, uh, crown of thorns into his head or even the ones that nailed him to the cross uh, that were whipping him? He did not. It was it was his meekness that allowed him to to, to show uh, his gentleness, display his gentleness. Uh, but always keep in mind that, that meekness is not weakness. Uh, it is anything but. And so uh, we have these these specific behaviors that are given to us: one towards our government, uh, other the other one towards our society, and then at the end, in, in verse three. And I don't have time to, to cover all these, but we have seven characteristics that are listed there of those that um, I guess you could say would be pre-conversion behavior. Um, a lot of these I can, I can easily identify because I acted like this before I got saved. Um, but there are seven characteristics there. Um, not to make a big deal of this, but you know, Usually the, the number seven is, is the number of completion or perfection. And so we have a perfect picture here of an unsafe person. Um, and so uh, we, uh, these are, are things that we should not be doing and we should be focusing on proper behavior. Point number three. Point number three in your outline, an incentive for godliness an incentive for godliness. We're going to jump back up to verse 13 in chapter 2 and look at 13, 14, and 15. And the first point that we're going to look at is Christ's death. Uh, letter A, Christ's death. If you look at verse 14, it says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And so, uh, if someone were to ask you why did Christ die, what was the what was the purpose of Christ's death? Um, I venture a lot of people would say so I could go to heaven, and that's all well and good because that's what we uh, what we gain from that. Um, but if you if you read verse fourteen, it says, "Who gave Himself for us for what purpose?" that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All iniquity. Uh, that little word all has never changed as far as the definition means. It means uh, all iniquity. Uh, every iniquity. And iniquity is simply uh, lawless, lawlessness or a violation of God's law. We could say it's sin uh, in, in that respect. But um, he paid the penalty uh, for sin and to purchase us for himself. It says that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Uh, so he, he paid the price for our sin so that he could redeem us. Now, in, a, in, in old times when they, they sold uh, a slave, it was, he, was, he was purchased with a price. The, the person who paid that price became the owner and that slave had to do with the new owner said. Okay? Same picture here. Christ paid the price for sin, the penalty for sin. We now become the, uh, the ownership of a new master that we need to, to follow. 
sins. And so uh, we have this uh, uh, redemption from all iniquity. But secondly, it says there in, in verse 14, and purify unto himself. And purify unto himself. Um, he wants, to, he wants to, to make pure a group of people that will be, number one, a peculiar people. I call it a weird people, but they're going to be different. Uh, this philosophy that we need to look and act like the world in order to be able to save people is just completely wrong. We need, there needs to be something different about us that's going to attract others. Um, but not only that, there needs to be something different about us so that we can glorify God. And so we're a, a peculiar people, and we've been uh, redeemed or purified to become that. It says also that we're to be a zealous people, zealous of good works. And um, uh, zealous, uh, we're, we're, intended, um, we're intended to change our behavior uh, to, uh, to this, um, this position of good works that he has here. But we need to be zealous about it. When was the last time you were zealous about something? That you were excited about something, that you you anticipated doing that thing, that you you looked forward to, you were excited about, it, and there wasn't anything that could keep you from doing it. And that's where we need to be in our Christian life. That's why Christ died for us, so that we could be excited about doing good works, not only for God, but for those people that don't know God, those people that want to persecute us. And so we need to make sure that we are, are uh, set aside, that we are uh, different, and that we are zealous in good works. Then we have be Christ coming. If you'll jump back up to verse 13, it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we know that Jesus is coming in the future. Okay? And when it says blessed hope, it's not the hope that the world would have, that they would cross their fingers and, and hope that something's going to happen. Our hope is, is completely different. We know it's going to happen. And our hope is that it's going to happen soon. And so uh, we look forward to uh, the second coming of Christ. We, we look forward to the appearing of Christ in the cloud. So first, he, he will appear as God. It says there, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God. Uh, he, is, he is our God. Jesus Christ is our God. Uh, I can't explain it to you, uh, but the Trinity is one, but yet they're all separate. Um, uh, the more you think about it, the more you get confused, and uh, it, it's just something you have to take by faith. That's what the Christian life is all about, taking it by faith. And so we need to understand that Christ will return as God, but he's also going to return as our Savior. As you'll see there in verse 3. Uh, 13, um, it says, uh, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When he returns, not only are we going to recognize him as God himself, but we're going to also recognize him as the one who redeemed us from our sin. And we're going we're gonna to see him as he is. So we're going to see him as a person who purchased us from sin. And we became his possession. And uh, uh, that should motivate us to, to be the peculiar people we need to be. To motivate us to be the zealous uh, people that we need to be doing good works. And so that, that is a motivation, verse 13, the coming of Christ. And then finally, verse, uh, point number C, verse 15, we see strong teaching. Paul says to Titus, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Uh, Titus is being uh, told by Paul that he needs to speak these things. He needs to exhort these things. He needs to rebuke. Everybody that we talk to is in a, a different position or a different place in life. And some people can be spoken to and and. They can correct their actions. Some people need to be exhorted. Uh, 
with more earnest um, before they will change their action. And then there are some that you just need a downright rebuke. But um, there are those people that are out there that you teach, or you speak, you exhort, you rebuke, and they still never change. We need to understand one thing. They're not rejecting us. They're rejecting God. But there's, there's something there that, that in that passage of Scripture that we need to understand. It says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. As Titus stepped out in, in decree and he, he addressed these issues that were at hand, he did so with the, the authority of Paul the Apostle back then. And then not only Paul the Apostle, but Jesus Christ. It's no different in our day. When we speak to somebody about Christ, when we speak to somebody about sin, uh, when we exhort them to come out of their sin, when we rebuke them because of their sin, understand that as long as we use the word of God, we have all the authority that we need. And we, can be, we are backed up by this authority. No one can speak against the word of God. There is no answer against the word of God. And so uh, we don't need to be given our opinions. We don't need to use our emotions. All we need to do is use the word of God. And it can change a person's life. It can make a difference. And so I, I leave you with that uh, today. Um, we, uh, a number of times in, in these passage scriptures, we look at the word good works. Good works. How much good works are you doing today? Are you reaching out to those that are doing wrong to you and giving good works? Are you reaching out to those uh, of the household of the faith with good works? Um, it, is, it is something that we were saved for. We weren't just saved to go to heaven. We were saved for good works. And are we doing so with the backing of authority? doing so uh, through the word of God. I encourage you this week um, uh, to uh, exhibit those zealous good works that uh, scripture talks about and, uh, and see how God responds. God bless us. I appreciate your time. Uh, next week we will look at lesson number six, uh, God willing, and that is godliness in action. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again uh, for all your goodness, grace, and mercy. And I thank you, Lord, that you did save me, that you pulled me from the depths of my sin. And Lord, now that I understand that I wasn't saved just to go to heaven, but I was saved for good works, I ask, Lord, that you would help me to do so. I am just simply a, a branch, and, and uh, you have the resources. You have the ability. You have the strength. And so help me to rely upon you to do what only you can do. And may you be honored and glorified through my actions and the actions of others. We ask these things in Jesus.